While occasionally referencing real life people and events, Heavy Head is a work of fiction that is not meant to be used as a diagnostic tool and contains adult language and situations. Listener discretion is advised. Hello, everyone. I'm Kip Casper, and welcome to America's favorite game show, Dire Consequences, a show that places contestants in alarming circumstances where they must perform increasingly difficult physical challenges in order to avoid Dire dire consequences. Consequences. Frank Bates is 14 years old. Born and raised in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Frank is a high school student who lives at home with his parents and sister, who all begin to feel the strains of his obsessive thoughts and compulsive behavior. This is his story. Ah. Good morning, sweetie. It's going to be a beautiful day. Breakfast in 20. Oh, Frank, right on time. Breakfast is almost ready. Can you set the table, please? Sure. What's for breakfast? French toast. It's your favorite. Hi, Camille. Good morning. (sighs) Unbelievable. Honey, what happened? The Braves and the Padres lost last night. We could have gained a game in the division and the wild card. Yeah, never going to catch anyone with that bullpen. I can't believe it. A few weeks ago, they were cruising in complete control. How did the wheels come off so quickly? I'm hungry. Can I have syrup on my French toast? It's on its way, Camille. Frank, I have your lunch packed and ready to go. Don't forget, your English paper is still sitting in the printer tray. I love that shirt on you. Thank you. Hun, don't forget to pick up my dry cleaning after you drop the kids off at school. Good morning. Today, we will begin to explore existentialism and some of the authors who have written through this philosophical lens. Existentialism, as a philosophy, explores the problems of the human condition and the inherent anxiety in dealing with the meaningless or absurd nature of life. It is the belief of existentialists that the individual is responsible for creating purpose or meaning and that individual purpose is not given to us by any outside force. The first book we read is The Stranger by French philosopher Albert Camus. This is one of his more famous works. Camus was once quoted as saying, In the depths of winter, I finally learned that within me there lay an invincible summer. 
Given what we just learned about the existential philosophy, who can interpret this quote? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? Yes, I know that you have an opinion, Frank. Let's see if anyone else can come up with something first. (sighs) All right, Frank, what do you think? Well, if the idea is that we are in control of finding our own purpose, then Camus must mean that we all have it within us to make the life we want for ourselves. That we are in control of our own lives. That's a great interpretation, Frank. Now, along with our assigned reading, we also have a companion writing assignment. In 1975, the rock band Queen released what many have called their masterpiece, Bohemian Rhapsody. It's been said that The Stranger was a major influence on Freddie Mercury's lyrics to this song. Your assignment, to determine whether or not Camus' writing did inspire the song. I want you all to research and think critically about this question, and then craft an argument either for or against the question. If I were you, I would listen to the song before you start reading, and be thinking about your argument as you go through the text. As for the specifics, this paper must be at least 10 pages, double-spaced, and must be typed, 12-point font, Times New Roman. The paper will be due five weeks from Friday on the 17th. Make sure that you're giving yourself enough time to work through this assignment. I really want you all to practice critical thinking. Not so fast. I want you all to read part one by Friday. Nice job, you fucking loser. You don't actually believe this horse shit, do you? Well, actually I do. Why should anyone else be in charge of your life? I like the idea of being in control, don't you? Uh, I don't know. I I think philosophy's dumb. Why does everything have to mean something? That's the most existential thing you've ever said. You're a fucking dork. (laughs) See you at cross-country practice. Dude, I forgot to ask you earlier. Have you seen the new game show on Fox? No. I don't watch much TV. You gotta watch it. It's called Dire Consequences. It's hosted by some washed up comedian or something. But every show has a family competing against themselves. You, you should see some of the stuff they make these people do. I can't even begin to describe it. Hear thee, hear thee. I present to you the fairest in the land, Lady Camille. I love playing with you, Frank. Quick, quick, turn the TV on. We're going to miss the intro. What channel is it? Channel 3. Mom, we're missing it. Why is everyone so worked up about a stupid game show? That's it. All right, let's meet today's contestants. It's the Bates family. Go ahead and introduce yourselves. Hello, my name is Kenny. This is my wife, Tracy, my son, Frank, and my daughter, Camille. (laughs) A lovely family. Okay, you all know how to play. We ask our contestants to choose one player from their team to be placed in alarming circumstances, where we offer lifelines in the form of increasingly difficult and bizarre physical challenges that our contestants must compete in order to avoid those dire consequences. So, Kenny, who do you choose to compete? I choose our son, Frank. (laughs) All right, Frank, step right up. Our first challenge of the night is called... Keep yourself alive! What if you have cancer? What was that? What's going on? Was... Was that just a dream? What if you have cancer? Frank! Breakfast is ready. Hey buddy, how'd you sleep? I had a dream that I was a contestant in that game show, and my consequence is that I have cancer. Oh honey, that's not funny. I didn't say it was f- Are you talking about Dire Consequences? Isn't that show the best? Oh, I love that show! (laughs) 
All right, class, your assignment for tonight. Read the first three chapters of part two of The Stranger. Cracks cause cancer! What? All right, folks. Frank has just learned that stepping on cracks causes cancer. His job now is to avoid all the cracks in the tile line hallways and to make things just a little bit harder. He only has so many steps to make it to his next class or the cancer inside him will grow even larger. Now let's go to the big board and see how many steps Frank has to get to his next class. Drum roll, please. It's been a few days since Frank has been avoiding cracks and counting his steps. Let's check in and see how he's doing. Dude, why are you walking like that? Like what? Like you're playing hopscotch. You were doing that last week too. Just walk straight. Stop acting fucking weird. Oh, I... I stepped on a rock at cross-country practice. Walking on my tiptoes helps. Well, why don't you just try a band-aid? People are starting to look at you. To look at us. I'll keep that in mind. Sorry that I embarrass you. Whatever. See you at lunch. 44, 45, 46, 47, 48. You know, I'm getting pretty good at avoiding cracks and getting the correct number of steps in, but I can still feel the cancer growing inside of me. There has to be more that I can do. But what is it? I know. Andy was right. Lunch. I have all this food. Maybe I could trade in a piece of food to make up for any mistakes I make. I won't miss it anyway. Frank! Dinner! 13, 14, 15... Did you say something, honey? Um, no. What Mrs. Bates doesn't know is that Frank has been bartering one piece of food for every compulsive mistake. He has made seven mistakes today, so all he can eat is one of his vegetables. Not only that, but Frank is about to learn that he is the only one who can set the table. Okay, well sit down and join us. The table setting is out of order! Rearrange the table or your cancer will spread! Who set the table? I did! Camille went to help with dinner, so I let her set the table. Well, normally that's something I would do. It's not exactly how I set things. I'm gonna move a few things around. Frank, it's fine the way it is. It's just a little awkward, that's all. Now Frank. Camille worked really hard and did a great job. Let's just eat. Just a couple minor things, just real quick. Well, at least let your sister help you. No! Frank, why did you do that? Let's play princess. If you play with your sister, you'll give her your cancer! Um, sorry Camille. I... I have a lot of reading to do for a paper I have to write. But we always play before bed. Cancer! I just can't. I'm... I'm sorry. Andy's texting me. What does he want? Cell phones cause cancer! One last reminder as we wrap up, don't forget your 10-page paper is due this Friday.
One, two, three, four. Huh. Usually Andy waits for me just outside the door. Hmm. Oh well. Just gives me more time to focus on my steps without worrying about anyone trying to bother me. Here you go, honey. French toast, your favorite. This isn't right. It has to be remade. Um, did you use a different recipe for this? No, why? Something just feels off about it. Do you mind making this again? What? I can watch you and make sure you didn't do anything wrong. That's no way to thank the person who just made your breakfast and packed your lunch. Frank has a 10-page paper due tomorrow that he hasn't been able to start because of his compulsions. As we go into our final round, consequences will be higher than ever as we introduce Total Chaos! Alright, I really have to get going on this paper. Desk! Chair! What? Your desk and chair cause cancer! Where am I supposed to do my homework? On the floor! You're only safe on the floor! Okay, I guess I'll just move my laptop to the floor. No computers! My paper has to be typed. If you use your computer, your family will die in a car crash! Okay, okay. I guess I'll just use notebook paper and a pen. No pens! Only a pencil and ten pieces of notebook paper! Okay, ten page paper on ten pieces of notebook paper. I can make this work. Oh shit, the paper ripped. Let me just grab a new piece of paper. No, only 10 pieces of paper allowed. Can I at least tape this ripped page together? Yes, but you're not allowed to sharpen your pencil until after you've written your fifth page. Come on, Frank. Get up and get dressed. We have to leave earlier this week. Ugh. I'm totally gonna bomb this paper. Time to tighten the screws one last time. What Frank doesn't know is that all of his clothes have been bugged with cancer-causing agents. No! That shirt causes cancer! You've gotta be kidding me. We said that this was going to get harder. Now try again! What about this shirt? No! What about this shirt? Nope! This shirt? No! These pants? Mm-mm! This hoodie? Wrong! Frank! Come on! Mom, you're gonna be late. I know, honey, I know. Frank! Now! Oh, honey, no! No what? Pajama pants and a ratty sweatshirt? Baby, you can't wear that to school. You said we were running late. What does it matter what I wear? But we spend all this money on nice clothes. You have so many nicer things to wear. Mom, you cannot be late. Ugh, fine. Just get in the car. We'll talk about this later. Wait. Dad usually takes us to school. He has jury duty the next two weeks. That's why I have to leave earlier so I can drop the two of you off before I go to work. That is not how things work! Um... What if I just walk to school this week? Frank, don't be ridiculous. That's too long of a walk. I don't have time for this. Get in the car.
All right, we have come to the end of our game. The Bates family is in total chaos as we have trapped Frank's life from every conceivable angle. His compulsions have caused him to count his every step, to not eat, to fall behind in school, to quit the cross-country team, to lose all his friends, and to make his family late by giving in to his compulsions. Let's check in with the family one last time. Mom, have you seen my science project? Shit, I spilled coffee on my tie. I'm gonna be late to jury duty. Honey, have you seen my light blue tie? Your tie is hanging on the rack. Cam, your project is on the dining room table. Frank, you better be getting ready. Cracks cause cancer. You already have no food left for the day. Your clothes cause cancer. Mom, please tell me that you washed my pajama pants and my hoodie. I'm going to be late again because of Frank. No, you're not, sweetie. Yes, Frank, I folded them and put them on top of the dryer. Can you bring them up for me, Mom? Just you. Your whole family is going to die because of you. Your cancer is everywhere, and now they all have it! Here, Frank. I grabbed them for you while I was getting my tie. No! Do not touch those. Get Mom. She has to rewash them. No one can go anywhere until she does. Frank, just stop it. I can't just stop it. You know, everything I've done for you all, and you've never once thanked me. Kenny, what is he talking about? Thank you for what, Frank? For keeping you alive? Everything I do is to keep you all safe. To keep you all, including myself, from getting sick or hurt. Frank, that doesn't make any sense. It doesn't have to make sense. The fact that everyone is still alive proves that I've been right to do all the things that I've done. But I just can't take it anymore. I can't keep going on like this. I'm sorry that I've made things so difficult for everyone these past couple weeks. Cam, I'm so sorry that I always make you late for school. I know what I'm doing is irrational, but I've lost everything. My good grades, my friends, my team. Everything I look at makes me feel sick. I can't eat because I'm too busy making sure I do everything else just right so the people I love don't die. All my clothes feel like they're attacking me. I can't sleep in my own bed because it means that you will all get sick. I have to sleep on the floor. I'm tired of running. I'm so exhausted. All right, class, time to move on to our next topic, the American beat poets of the 1940s and 50s. We will have another writing assignment to go along with this that must be typed. I'm looking at you, Frank. He's trying his best. Hey, thanks for sticking up for me back there. I thought that you didn't want to be friends with me anymore. Of course I do. You were just acting strange. You stopped texting me back. You quit the team. Just thought you didn't care about me anymore. I do care. I've just been... I've been sick. I have obsessive compulsive disorder. It's why I was counting things and walking funny. I don't know if you remember all that, but I've been seeing a therapist. She's been helping me learn that my thoughts aren't real and that everything in my life isn't trying to hurt me. Oh, OCD? That's just like organizing and checking things, right? Like everybody gets a little OCD from time to time. I'm that way about making sure my stuff's organized. It's not that bad. Well, not really. It's a lot more involved than that. Your brain convinces you that everything around you is trying to hurt you or your loved ones, and it makes you perform tasks or avoid certain things in order to keep the people you love safe. It really takes over your life to the point where you're no longer in control. It's quite debilitating. But you're going to a doctor, so you're like cured or something? Well, no, not quite. I have to keep exposing myself to all my triggers and learn that they're not gonna hurt me. It's sort of a process. But I'm a lot better than I was. You could have told me. Yeah? Duh, it would have explained a lot, but also because I care about you. Obviously there was something fucked up with you. 
I was too preoccupied with my thoughts to begin to think that this was something I should have told other people. By the time I started to get help, everything in my life seemed to just disappear. My therapist gave me a few pamphlets about OCD to give to people to help them understand what I've been going through. Okay, thanks. I mean, I still don't really understand what you're going through, but I'll read through this, take your word that you're getting the help that you need, are getting better, and that I'll do whatever you need me to make sure that you keep getting better. Dr. Charles Brady is a clinical psychologist and founder of Kitsap Peninsula OCD and Anxiety Services, an evidence-based treatment facility located in Silverdale, Washington. He focuses his research on obsessive compulsive disorder and other related anxiety disorders. We talked with Dr. Brady over the phone to discuss the topic of OCD. What is obsessive compulsive disorder or OCD? OCD is a psychiatric disorder in which a person experiences thoughts, images, or impulses that pop into their mind, into their experience that create a great amount of distress. And when that distress is created, the person responds by doing behaviors in an attempt to neutralize them. And we call these behaviors compulsions. What are obsessions? What are compulsions? OCD is comprised of both obsessions and compulsions. Mm -hmm. Obsessions strike like lightning bolts. They are those thoughts, images, or impulses that come into a person's experience. We call them egodystonic because they do not match the person's value system or their principles. The mm -hmm. person doesn't want these thoughts. These thoughts and images and impulses go against their grain. So when these thoughts pop in, they strike like lightning bolts and they create a great amount of distress. The compulsions are behaviors or countermeasures that a person takes to reduce that distress. They can be behaviors like washing hands or checking the stove over and over. But they can also be cognitive or what we call mental compulsions, where a person's worried that they shouted out a curse word in the middle of a movie theater that they might mentally review over and over in that mind that scene dozens of times trying to gain certainty that they did not shout out the curse word. These countermeasures are what we call compulsions. The person tries to use them to minimize the distress, but unfortunately, every time that you do a compulsion, it's actually creating more distress in the brain long term. How is OCD diagnosed? OCD is diagnosed primarily by clinical interview. We have several screening instruments, questionnaires that people can fill out, symptom checklists. But at this point, there's no blood test, there's no genetic marker that we can use to identify the presence of OCD. But a trained clinician knows how to ask the questions about a person's anxiety to help understand and help diagnose whether or not these thoughts that they're experiencing go beyond just general worries, if they're actually true obsessions, and if the behaviors that the person is evidencing are compulsions and would meet the diagnostic criteria. When should someone seek treatment for their OCD? When they start noticing that they're doing an excessive number of countermeasures when they have disturbing thoughts. Mm -hmm. So it's not just if someone washes their hands, but when we say excessive, it's not necessarily so much a certain number that you do. But what starts to happen is these behaviors start to have an impact on the person's ability to function in their life roles. And so when you start to see, hey, this is really impacting my ability to be the type of dad that I want to be. All this time that I spend checking doors makes it harder for me to get to work on time. You sure. really want to take a look at, hey, when I'm doing these behaviors, is it starting to have a negative impact on the roles in which I function in life? What should loved ones be looking for if they suspect their loved one may be living with OCD? Yeah, that's a great question because OCD can be very subtle. There have been studies years ago that suggest that before a person seeks treatment for OCD, that their symptoms have already been existing for upwards of 17 years because it's very easy for these symptoms to be very subtle. You know, people who have OCD, they feel very ashamed of it because they know that what they're doing doesn't make sense and they feel guilty by doing these things. They feel ashamed of it and they're afraid others will think of them as crazy. So they learn very often to hide them so that others don't see them and don't judge them negatively as a result. Some of the things you can look for if you're worried about a family member having OCD, one thing that you often see is that excessive reassurance question. 
Mm -hmm. They might ask you the same question over and over. Uh, Are you sure that front door is locked? Did you check twice? Also, if you start seeing them having more delays, in other words, they start getting to work later, they have a hard time arriving for meetings on time. Many times, because compulsions tend to grow and take up more time and energy, they start to preempt our ability to get to meetings on time, get to appointments on time, to get to places where typically we would arrive on time. But since we're devoting extra time and energy to the compulsions, they start interfering with that. Also, avoidance. I mentioned that before. If you're starting to see that your family member has stopped doing things that they used to do, you know, maybe they used to play sports, but all of a sudden they, they, they're not as interested in going to the gym anymore. They're not as interested as going out with friends, or maybe they volunteered a lot at their child's school and they stopped volunteering. Sometimes the reason for the avoidance is because there's something there that they're afraid of that will trigger their OCD. What are the first steps someone should take? to get help for their OCD? First step is to talk to your doctor about it, talk to a family member about it. OCD grows best in the dark. Mm -hmm. So when we're not talking about it, when we're not disclosing it, it will just continue to grow and grow. It, It tends not to be something that just goes away on its own. And it is something that left untreated tends to get worse. And when we think about what someone should do for their first steps, one of the things I advise everyone is educate yourself about it. There's a great resource on the internet, the International OCD Foundation, iocdf.org. They have a wealth of solid, scientifically-based information on there for folks who are concerned that they might have OCD or that a family member might have it. They've got references from many books and other informational pamphlets that a person can connect with to learn more about what it is that they may be facing and how to get help for it. Don't hesitate. Go as soon as possible. You don't want to give OCD a head start. That just makes it that much harder to get the treatment. The sooner you get in for treatment, the easier it is to treat. The other step that I would suggest is Mm -hmm. when you're seeking providers, screen them. Make sure that they have an understanding and experience in the types of treatments that help folks with OCD. What are evidence-based treatments for OCD? OCD does not respond generally well to just general supportive psychotherapy. For someone who's treating OCD as a therapist, you want to make sure that they're experienced and well-versed in providing evidence-based treatment. And right now, the two evidence-based treatments for OCD are exposure and response prevention and also acceptance and commitment therapy, or what we call ACT. There are also quite a few medications that have very significant and good evidence base for them. We know that when folks combine medication and psychotherapy Mm -hmm. together, they tend to get better faster. What advice do you have for someone seeking treatment for their OCD? When you're learning to beat OCD, it's like learning to play an adversary in chess. The more that you understand about it, the more you're going to have an easier time to defeat it, to shrink it, to make it a much more manageable part of your life so that it's no longer causing the problems and suffering that it does. I can't stress that enough. The good news is there's so much more information out there now than there used to be when I first started treating OCD. General advice, don't hesitate. The people who are helping you know how to treat this disorder. This is not a disorder that is unbeatable. It can be treated. It can be beaten. There are folks out there who are skilled and trained and can know how to guide you along that path. When people start to reduce their compulsion, the brain really has no choice but to recalibrate and to become desensitized. The tough part is helping folks with the courage to do what feels so scary to them. We know how to work with this part of the brain to change things around. If you've got the determination and can summon up the courage to do what feels uncomfortable, you'll get better. What are some myths that people believe to be true about OCD that are actually false? One is... (laughs) That, that it's a cute disorder, that unfortunately sometimes the portrayals of OCD on TV is that it's kind of a cute, quirky disorder, and people mm-hmm. without OCD don't realize how devastating it can be. We know that folks with OCD, at least 36% of them have had suicidal ideation. It's not a gentle disorder. You know, right. Left untreated, it can wreak havoc in a person's life. It's also annually in the top 10 causes of disability for working age adults of all medical conditions, not just psychiatric conditions, but all medical conditions. So when it hits untreated, it's devastating. It can crush a person's life. 
And unfortunately, sometimes the portrayals on TV or, or media is that it's kind of a cute disorder that people find a little quirky and a little funny. But for right. the person who's struggling with OCD and their families, it's far from that. One of the other myths is that mm -hmm. this is a rare disorder, that oh, you, no one knows people with OCD. But if you think of that prevalence rate, over 2% of the adult population having it, we all know people who have OCD. We might not know that they have OCD because they might be working so hard to not let it be seen by others. But every single one of us knows someone who has OCD. So it's not rare. It, it's unfortunately too, too common. The last myth I like to talk about, mm -hmm. and I like folks who have OCD is that the thoughts that you're having are not crazy thoughts. Now, the thoughts that a person has with OCD are no different than the thoughts that a person without OCD has. The only difference is that when a person with OCD has them, they feel great alarm. You know, many times when I speak in front of groups and I talk about OCD, I'll ask, okay, you know, you don't have to raise your hands, but hey, has anyone out there ever had a thought of when you're driving down the highway of, huh, what if I swerved in oncoming traffic? Now, what we know is well over 85 people who answer that question on a survey will say, yes, I've had that thought. Since most people don't have OCD, are able to have that thought and just dismiss it as, huh, that, that's a meaningless thought. The difference is not the content. The difference is that the person with OCD, when they have that thought, their alarm system goes off and they become terrified. If you have OCD, I don't care what the content of your thoughts are. It's not crazy content. What's happening is your brain is false alarming. You're having normal thoughts, but it's your alarm system reaction that is overly sensitive. But we can fix that. We can reduce the sensitivity of that alarm system so that when those thoughts pop in in the future, you're able to have the reaction that other people have as they drive down the street and have that thought pop in their mind. Heavy Head, Season 2, Episode 1. This Magical Thinking is written and produced by Tanner Hines. Game show host voiced by Mike Helensky. Tracy Bates, voiced by Sharon Noshang. Frank Bates, voiced by Adam Dill. Camille Bates, voiced by Tori Conley. Teacher, voiced by Tanner Hines. Andy, voiced by Luke Fagenbush. Narration and art design by Evan Verrilli. Thank you to Dr. Charles Brady for taking the time to speak with us. Learn more about Kitsap Peninsula OCD and Anxiety Services by visiting their website, www.kitsapocd.com, or call 360-234-4623. Learn more about OCD by visiting the International OCD Foundation's website at www.iocdf.org. Original music by Real Blue Heartache Kids. The music is available online wherever you buy or listen to music. If you or a loved one is experiencing a psychiatric emergency and live in the United States, please call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-8255 for free and confidential support 24-7-365. Or text HOME to 741741 to receive free and confidential support 24-7-365 from the Crisis Text Line. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram using the handle at HeavyHeadPod. Subscribe to our official YouTube channel, Heavy Head Podcast. You can email us at HeavyHeadPod at gmail.com. Please rate and review us on iTunes. We'd love to hear from you. If you enjoyed the show, please share us with a friend or relative. You can support the show by making a monthly monetary pledge when you join our Patreon page at patreon.com slash heavyheadpodcast and get access to exclusive content. You can also support the show by making a one-time monetary donation to paypal.me slash tannerhines1. That's paypal.me slash T-A-N-N-E-R-H-I-N-D-S, the number one on PayPal, or at T-Hines-1, that's at T-H-I-N-D-S, the number one on Venmo. Lastly, merch is available at heavyhead.bigcartel.com. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next month. 
Until then, take care of yourself.